formally introduce the speaker today. Uh, so, Professor Peggy Mohan uh, is originally from Trinidad and uh, is a scholar who did a PhD in linguistics from the University of Michigan. And then she went came to India, taught at several places in India, including J. Jamia, and also taught, taught teaches music apart from linguistics yeah. uh, at uh, Basan Valley Public School in some for some time, and then now teaches at Ashwaka. Linguistics and also maybe next year I'll teach music. music too. So she's a she's a woman of many talents, languages. So I'm happy to welcome her for the talk at the PI University today. And then we have also bothered her with a long list of questions. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So we are also happy that we accepted to answer those questions to this talk. So I formally welcome you. So let me start with this is my little slide. So start for me because this is something that I myself do to show the for the cover of the book. Uh, I, I wanted to have something that looked a little more alive than just graphics. So I drew this line of men and coming in with what must have been a force in those days and looking a little different from what I get on key. What I wanted to, to show is, this is what a migration looks like, but we're going to start with something that is not really a migration. Uh, migration, you notice everyone in this line is a man. That's important because when the first people come, it's probably not a migration, which is why you also get women. So let me, I just go on page down, to get to the next slide. Yes, yes. Chris. Raise down. Okay. Oh, there. Okay. Right. Okay. I think you've probably all seen this. Um, I think even Tony Joseph must have uh, shown this migration. Uh, it's called a migration. I don't want to call it a migration for the simple reason that you see at the bottom of the slide is men and women. Women generally don't migrate. Uh, my reason for not calling it a migration is um, it took an awfully long time to happen. Imagine taking about 5,000 years to get from Yemen to the top of South Asia. They were not migrating. They were merely being. They were shifting. And that is why the families were merely spreading so that it, so that there were women who came in this group too. My work right now in a mixed languages is women are critically important to languages passing on and mixing because men in originate languages very well too, on the high seas and all of that. But with with no one to pass them on to, no scope of having children because they're all men, or the first migrants to the Caribbean from India, or maybe from Bengal, we have no trace of them. They were men. They had no offspring, or if they did, their offspring did not blend into a community as such. They were only men. It's only when women seem to be involved that we get the start of something. So the very first people out of Africa to come to India included men and women. You'll notice in this that it's not the usual route. When you read all the European things about migrations out of Africa, it follows the yellow line at the top to Sinai. Sinai. There have been a number of them out from there. Uh, there have been remains found in the Palestine region. But they don't link to any human beings who are alive now. So they were unsuccessful migration. But they pushed back either by the Anglicans, by the weather, by whatever. The point is, these all the migrations into Europe happened during warm, wet periods when the desert was full of flora and fauna. The migration into India was different. It was during an ice age. And what that did is it made the crossing into Yemen, which is already fairly easy. I mean, your boat as it's going sometimes hits rocks. It is so shallow. It was even shallower. They were able to cross 
And I don't think they thought they were going anywhere. They just found themselves in a place where there were herds to follow and there was vegetation. You could eat the vegetation, the herds were eating the vegetation, and they moved and moved and moved towards the subcontinent. And that took about 5,000 years, not a migration. These were what we call the first Indians. Now, what I want to do in this whole talk, as far as we get in the time of epic, is to see how what happened in India squares with some of the things we have begun to find elsewhere. So we have a model of how migration happens and how languages pair up with it or happen as a result of it, how the two give a mirror to each other. Yeah. Okay, what do we know about the languages of these people? We're talking about 65,000 years of that. It's a horribly long time. Sometimes 15 years are enough for a language to be born or to die. That's how long a generation. So when you think of 65,000 years, we're really dreaming when we think we come with something very concrete. But fortunately, there are a lot of things we're not conscious of in language, and those are the sort of things that can be made. So if you want to think of what was there that they brought, that has to be attributable to these first Indians who came. Uh, let's see, I'll show you the next slide. Here we go. All right. You see this, compare the two slides. You see the route roughly mapped, you see it starts in Africa. The deeper the orange and brown, the stronger the influence. What we're finding is retroflexion. Do I need to stop and explain for a minute yes, what's retroflexion? Right. Let me see if I can show you in the next slide. Okay, here is Every linguistic student has drawn the vocal tract. When you put the tongue in the green position, the right behind the teeth, you get a thumb. When you put it right behind the alveolar ridge, you may not hear it unless you're a Malayali or a Assamese or a Brit. You get a ter, which is neither ter nor ter. When you have the retracted position of it, facing towards the palate. Yeah. I think in your own languages, almost every language of India, if you're not speaking Assamese or one of the Northeastern languages, you would be able to find examples. I can tell you like in Hindi, putta, putta, right? We have the word daant, ki, very interesting, two then, three dental sounds in the word putta, daant and daant. Dant is somebody yeah, yelling at you. So these are what the reason I'm doing this is I'm showing you that you actually almost get minimal pairs. I remember once I, I come from a community of India that went away. Uh, so we lost this. So when I was getting it on the speech and recordings from old women who come to the Caribbean from India on the boats. A uh, woman was telling me about the ancestors in India who would uh, go away, the Alan Quins. And I thought she was saying go away. I would wash it. Why would you wash it before putting people to sit in it? No, she meant go away, to carry. So the go away and go away are in contrast. So you can see straight away that this is something that we are all familiar with in India. And that people like me have to struggle to get back because every Indian who leaves India within a generation loses it. It's, it's like a marker of what is India. Um, I want to see if I, uh, I went as far as this. Okay. Now, I'm going to go back to here. You will notice it. It's you don't get it at all in Southeast Asia, except for New Guinea, right? You don't get it in 
the Gulf, the Arab world, you don't get it now in Iran. This is a map of today, of, of the situation for retroflexing. I read What's happening? Is something not connected? Somebody's trying to ask. Jean, if you don't have a question, can you mute yourself? Yeah, I'm getting a sound and I don't know who it is. Okay, he's going to die. Okay, yeah. Now, when I saw this thing that did not exist in the Indo European languages, did not exist in Southeast Asia, retroflexion, I wondered does it exist anywhere else on Earth? Because after all, South Asia couldn't be unique in this respect. It could. We are unique in a number of respects, but was, was this one of them? And then I found this uh, article on a study of retroflexion elsewhere. You even see a little bit in the Georgian focus us, where I've scribbled a little bit of yellow, where there's retroflexion, but maybe not of the go away, go away kind, where you get minimal pairs, where it creates a meaning difference. But you do get it right at the place where the crossing was made from Africa, which is Ethiopia and Somalia. It's vanished elsewhere because population replacement. You get it all in South Asia down to the Andamans. That was the shock. The Andamans has retroflexion. They have been separated from South Asia for thousands of years. Then nothing, 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 nothing. Population replacement, Southeast Asians. Then you listen to a tape of first Australians. Da, 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 da. It just blew my mind. There are people who go from India and listen to the first Australian languages, people sitting behind them in a restaurant and say, somebody is speaking Tamil. And they look, I mean, I don't have to need to be Tamil. Quite a lot of other Indian languages which have all of this, but they have it. And I happened upon a tape where they were teaching you how to make these songs, which is a no-brainer for us. The whole continent, all the Australian Aboriginal languages have it. And you notice the middle of New Guinea, the New Guinea Highlands, are people who were not discovered by the outside world until the 1930s. They live completely alone. They have a third, in addition to the so what that tells me straight away is that we're not looking at something Dravidian, we're not looking at something Sanskrit, we're looking at something much, 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 much older, which goes all the way back to Africa. And it's just that where it doesn't exist, it always seems to link to population replacement. The first migration out of Africa, if there's one thing we can say was there in the pandemic, we can't talk about the nouns, the verbs, the syntax, we can say there was retroflexion. And on the next question, we'll see it later when we look again at the map of South Asia. But uh, it's everywhere. There are two little dots in the center of the Indian landmass, two tribal languages, Korku and Sura which apparently don't have it. They're like Assamese, they're like English. And then I looked, <clears throat> I got hold of Grierson's uh, survey of India from, from 1919, which this time was having it. So it's just possible that they had it and lost it, which is very interesting. Why should that happen? Well, it's not crazy. We lost it. My community, my, my undergraduate work on how this got lost in our dialect in the Caribbean. That the old ones came in. I couldn't even hear that they were getting everything right. Uh, I couldn't hear it. I just thought they were speaking like me and that we'd all lost it. And I was told, no, no, the people born in India still have it. 
and the people of the, from the next generation on, you get it sporadically. Like my father would say, go feed, because he knew you have to do that. He didn't know why he was doing it. He got it right, but he didn't have a sense of retroflexion as being an important feature that he had to keep up. It vanished immediately. So it can go <clears throat> and it can come, which we will discover later. So I'm looking at this as that bedrock thing that is the most Indian thing of all. Uh, I am going to go off my notes or just wing it now and say, according to genetics, there is a haplogroup, the M haplogroup, which is almost only found in South Asia. Uh, there's something of it somewhere in Southeast Asia. All the other further things like Australians, first Australians, we believe, they have diverged too many thousands of years ago to be quite similar. But the M haplogroup is almost exactly matched to the area that has retroflexion. South Asia. I don't know about Assamese. Assamese doesn't have reflection. It may be that it had it one time, but that's the sort of thing I would like to know. But how general a term you need to have to get a picture of what the people who first came to India spoke like. They were not the first people who came to India, by the way. They came to India did not notice. They did not find an empty country. There were hominids who were not yet homo sapiens. And there was, now we say, a certain amount of intermixing. There was a certain amount of avoidance of each other. And at some point later on, the people who came to India developed sufficiently good stone tools to defeat these others. It always does seem to happen like that. Again, clearing of population. This time, the first Indians cleared, the pre-first Indians. So here's the retroflexion zone. Now let's look at see what else happened. And if you want to be interrupted, uh, yeah, please. Um, I want to ask you how long it takes to lose it because uh, there's a Bengali community both Dixon and Malaysia, but the parents still have it and the children don't have it. And I'm wondering about uh, jumping to the genetic basis of it rather than explaining it at the cultural level. If the Chinese and the Malays around them don't have it, and so the Indians have no use yeah. for it. And so it just acted to use rather than oh, having right. genetic basis. No, I didn't mean genetic in that sense. Oh. Like the footprint, the genetic oh. footprint of the South Asia is the M haplogroup. Oh. And it also is coincidentally the same footprint oh. as retroflexion. You're absolutely right. It takes a generation. Oh. So normally this the next generation, they speak the language very well. Uh, and in fact, the language often remains for two, three generations in such a situation with no further contact with India. But like I was speaking to people who were about third generation, I myself am fifth, uh, and they didn't have a sense of retrospection. It was all gone by then. Apart from they might attempt to put a letter up at the end of a word, um, which Creole doesn't do. Some didn't even do that. But the point is, yes, it is one generation out of India, this gets lost. Gypsies uh, have an M haplogroup, they don't have retroflexion. Indians in Mauritius, Caribbean, M haplogroup, no retroflexion. I have struggled to get it back. I can pronounce it. I think you know this pretty well. I hear it less well than I can pronounce it. So if you tell me a word, I might go on a Google search to, to see for sure, to check what you just said. Because I might not hear uh, the, the, that clearly. My professor Peter Hook also said he can do it very well in Marathi. They have a lot of them. He pronounces them very well. But the imprinting in the brain from childhood has not been done. So it's an uh, effort. Just the same way as for many Indians, Remembering a war and a war as two very, very different things uh, is an effort. It's the same kind of an effort. Yeah. Now, okay, this is a map I drew. All of these are my own maps. I drew my maps partly because I was told that, especially after Wendy Donegar, that uh, the Indian government was after a blood. 
and that uh, they will get all our books out if they be put in maps that they didn't agree with. So I put in maps that did not discuss territory at all. And they said, don't even put the outline. So on my in my book, you will see this map, but the outline is really erased. So I'll be pulped. And the only way not to be pulped is to apply for permission to some map board, pay a lot of money, and take your chance whether they will approve. And then they may also say, well, no. And they're very partial in who they think is going to say something favorable to them. And in this case, uh, linguists are suspicious people, you know. I mean, here we when we be talking about things like Rebellions and Aryans, I mean, like, what could she be about to say? So, no, so I, I didn't make it as a map. This is a, this is a diagram. And it has no borders in the final thing, just color. Look at this. You see an interesting thing. If the first Indians came, they, everywhere else, you only have the, the maybe somewhere maybe somewhere else, somewhere here in Australia. So we're assuming that some of that was original. Vera does not seem to be original. Vera is only Tamar and Malaya. Correct? Is it an innovation? It's an interesting question because it goes above and beyond the original. And it is the sort of thing that is quite possible. So that somewhere you, you see it getting deeper as you go deeper in, but you see something else. You see the entire western flank of India lining up with the south. Western flank means including Pakistan. All the Pakistan areas are third, uh, Rajasthan and Gujarat, however, not much, but they have it. Marathi, Kannada. Telugu have I have not the thought of with the girls and girls and so yet. Um, Tamil Nadu have, and Kerala have So it's deepening as you go in. So that's an important point to make because if you want to say later that it came into Sanskrit, you can't say it came from that area up there, which is pretty light and orange and yellow. It has to have very deep roots for a very long time in India. But if it was there before the Dravidians and the Dravidians took it and did much more with it, then by the time Sanskrit came, Sanskrit did not come to a place that didn't have it. It came to a place that this is where me and Hansong would have a little bit of a problem. Okay. Yes. What about Sri Lanka? Andaman has it. Andaman has it to the extent that Kashmiri, I mean, Himachali, and all these have it. Actually, I don't know what the Himachali has only turned up. Kashmiri has turned up. Andaman has it. And that is just shocking because they have not been in touch with the mainland. They have not been in touch with the Dravidian migration. So, again, proof that it is older. Now, what is older? Look at Bengal, the whole area going into the Korku area, the pink area. I would tend to say, except for the Ra being there, which is something I had to struggle with, um, that must have been close to the original. The original was probably like the Andamans, the under, except for now, you get in Australia even now. So I'm just my point being that the, in, in the south of India, you not only get more retroflexes, you get them more frequently. Uh, who knows this good Malayalam song? Who turned out to Jerry? Who to It's not just the 
sounds is the quantity of them. They're much more frequent. Like you'll get them in 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 Gujarati as well, but not so often. So there's also a question of often happening and a larger variety. There's some such a thing as growth. Things don't only get lost, they also can grow. It is very interesting that it's seen as part of this system that Tamil, Malayalam, bumped it up a notch. Okay. So he has a sense of the bedrock. All we know about these old people is that they had this reflection. And that everyone who came in had to do something about it. Because pretty soon, all the other migrations, starting with the Dravidians, whatever that was, it must have, they could have been a diverse bunch of Dravidians. Um, the Vedic people, the Southeast Asians, all of these had one feature in common. They were almost born men. And when men come, they either die with no children, or they marry women there and have children, which means that the children have mothers who are different from the men. Now, let me see where I have got to. I'm reading it from here. Here is this. It's interesting that there's this is my <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, this is a Dravidian migration. Yes. The Dravidian migration is technically called. Iranian farmers. A little 10 year old boy asked me this question at the meeting like this. I gave the 10 year old this. And he said, uh, Why would farmers move? Will they stay where their crops are? It's a good question. Uh, they move most probably because of climate change. Yeah? Okay. Right. Uh, they moved probably because of some things to do with climate change. They moved into the Baluchistan, Mangar area. And uh, there must have been a small number of women, but not that many. Remember, they were voluntary migrants. And voluntary migrants almost always are all men. We don't know much about their language except to say that they didn't get. They immediately got to like the idea of retroflexion. I put a little line going out south, yes? It's very funny, but it doesn't seem to happen even in the animal kingdom. Uh, in the beginning of my book, I talk about uh, polar bears uh, having offspring with grizzly bears. It's always the grizzly male migrating and the, and the female not migrating. So if you know that you see a a bear that's half polar, half grizzly. Its father was grizzly, its mother was polar, and it was conceived on dry land in the Arctic, not on an ice floe, because there aren't so many ice floes. You see all these kinds of things happening. So for me, um, oh, my mother did. My mother's story is almost the same. Uh, my father, young Indian boy, goes to Canada to study. Nice, normal thing. He's of the age where you fall in love and want to get married, but only men are migrated, except his sisters also, and that's different. Um, and my mother from a small island, not so small, an island of Canada, is sent to Canada to study. She's on dry land and she meets this grizzly. <laughs> and she falls in love and he, um, and in those days when you fall in love you didn't think a million times how will it work and that she will never see snow again in her life she goes all the way to the Caribbean back with her and that's that complains about weather like this which I being born there think it's wonderful but to her she, she never ever saw snow again but Again, the idea that he went to a place, found a slightly displaced local, and because in those days that's the way things happen. Women generally don't migrate. When in indentureship and slavery, women had to migrate. I'm looking at that too. Immense efforts had to be made to get them to come. Many women had to be bribed, and that, and they had to be families. And there had to be the feeling that the woman was alone, her husband was gone. Many of the women who went to the Caribbean from India, for example, widows, they were running away. You could run away. You can do that. Uh, 
Well, these kinds of things, but definitely not a normal situation of man marries wife and takes a very few of the couples going had not met or just before they boarded the boat. <coughs> so there was a feeling that the kind of woman who migrates is a more desperate and adventurous type. And it's not the family type situation that we normally expect. It's strange, but it doesn't happen anywhere. Indian six went to California. They not allowed to marry white women, they married Mexicans. So you have a community of Indian men with Mexican wives. So it's just a very, it is one of those things that we almost take as an axiom that women won't migrate until times are so good, like now, where like my daughter in Silicon Valley meets all the classmates from school in Delhi and NID because they are available. But in my time, my husband met me, someone from another part of the world, an Indian lady, but from another part of the world. My father met my mother from another part of the world. Because in those days, women from your own community were very scarce. Okay, so here, this is the second. See how far back it goes? Let's say 10,000 years. So the Dravidian presence, if we call it Dravidian, I don't know why we call it that, because it may be more than one thing. It may not just be one group. We find reason to say that. Now comes the next group, and it's much later. It's not the people. Where is my idea? The next group is from Southeast Asia, which is why Bengalis, Assamese, Oriyas, and people from the east of UP and Bihar are a little Asian in our outlook, in our language, and in our looks, and in a few other things, and in our rice. Yes, 4,000 years ago came another migration of people, again men. We, we don't know about this except from genetics. Genetics told us that just at the same time that Indian rice got Japonica rice genes, uh, Indian people in this region, and they actually checked people who thought they were pure or dust, sometimes and so on. They traced about 75% of them traced back to Southeast Asia on the male line. And in the samples tested so far, 0% of the people. That's like an intense difference. Now you have a male-driven migration again into this area, and there are lots of interesting things. Uh, so they came into a situation where first Indian languages were being spoken uh, and brought in features of Southeast Asia, words, of course, a bunch of words of Vietnamese and so on that. I had a list somewhere, which I just deleted because I didn't want to read this already. In these languages, and this is long, long before there were things like that, we'll get to that later. Uh, so these languages got an infusion. Now, just at the time that this happened, just as at the time that the Dravidians came into the north, along with the population being affected, the crops were affected. So suddenly, with the Dravidians came settled farming. When you have settled farming, you have huge crop, uh, crop yields, so you have population really growing. And the people who are responsible for the crops growing are very much a part of the population growing too. So you have a spurt in that area and the Indus Valley sets up. In this area, rice came. And the rice suddenly, India was growing rice 3,000 years, but not very high yield, very formal. Then came Japonica rice, huge yields, and suddenly lots of surpluses. And these men stayed intermarried with local women and huge yields of population. So the two big surges in population came after the hunter-gatherer time when settled farming and improved crops happened. So now we have not yet even reached Sanskrit. So much has happened already. <clears throat> These languages maintain the third. Uh, no. I don't know. No, no, it's not that much. 
It's there as in a Sunday. It isn't there like in Punjabi or Malayalam where it where I mean you don't get that kind of thing so much in you get it in Punjabi, but not in the heartland. So we having a sense of the language stage. Here comes the great Vedic migration, invasion, whatever you want to call it, depending upon your definition of it. This was clearly not little men walking in one by one and saying, we want to be friends with you, we want to speak what you speak. The way people migrate into Kerala nowadays, they go in there, they sit down and they say, to learn your language, and if you happen to know English, you will happen to learn it very well. But uh, when migrants go in one by one and decide that they're going to settle with whatever is there, you don't get much language to. But the point is that you did get it here. You got a bunch of people who have changed the entire look of India almost down. Tamil Nadu is the least affected state. Every other state is affected. Kerala is affected in a different way from the others. But these people, that kind of uh, impact on the subcontinent is not little men walking in and saying we want to be friends with you. It is something new. So they came uh, around the 1700s. There's a lot of evidence that they did not. Uh, hit pan into a <clears throat> Indus Valley civilization that was in full swing. What is most important about them is for the first time they left the document. And the document is the whole Rig Veda. And the Rig Veda, though it was not written, it was memorized and memorized in great phonetic detail. We think that I would say that the detail got edited since it was not written. Uh, and over it almost immediately and over time the Rigveda itself went to action. Guess what? Everything that comes to India gets retroflection. How many of you speak Indian English without retroflection? Only Anglo-Indians do. And they quietly put it in when they have to do political speeches. So the only Indians who did not really pick up retroflection in English were the Anglo Indians. When you hear Derek O'Brien and you know what he's talking about being <laughs> a foreign nation <laughs> in India. Yeah. yeah. So Sanskrit picked it up. Why did it pick it up? Um, we have no idea what the people who brought the document to composed the document, spoke when they were just talking to each other on the street. I imagine it was something like Sanskrit, simply because of prophets also or something like Sanskrit. That's the best sentence I can find. It could have been quite different. It could have been like in the case of the Mughals and the Sultanate that they spoke Uzbek first and then they brought Persia. There's some people who suggest that. I don't think so, simply because you know. The Sanskrit itself leaked into the Prakrits and it suggests that whatever was being spoken was in some way similar. So, but again, then, and as we know, which I'll tell you before, men make up pigeons all the time, men make up languages all the time, and they die, they vanish because they have no children. So these men had to have to, but they wanted to create a presence. They um, married local women and did all kinds of things to justify that this disorder was being let into their lives, all sorts of things that the Rig Veda do not trust these women and so on. And they had children. Now, this is a common thing on the planet where one tribe overtakes another tribe. There's a, a carrot tribe that I deal with in the Caribbean. I actually I have a friend from that tribe who was an informant for field methods when I went to Michigan. And he, uh, and we'd ask him over, what's the word for woman? And then he'd stop and he'd say, Do you want the man's word or the woman's word? Uh, I need the, the, 
woman's word for woman, I should remember right now. Uh, I don't <laughs> but it ends with a whispered letter. Uh, I can't remember exactly the man's word, but really with a very sound that you get in Tamil and Malayalam and Turkish and not many other places. Two totally different languages. Um, he's in the 1200s, uh, he's for the Arawakan tribe sleeping on the island of St. Vincent. And they were attacked by a raiding party of Caribs. A raiding party, all men. They killed the men, and of course, Caribbean law would tell you they ate the men. Because it, the word cannibal comes from Carib. And married the woman. And that's in the 1200s. And this is like now, what, 900 years later? They still have a difference. The men who eat their Carib, the women who eat their Arabic. It's come a little less. And uh, men are allowed to use for men's words, this book women are still not allowed to use men's words. Um, so you, you have it in the north, I don't know if you have it in the south. Uh, somebody like one woman said, could not read the teleprompter in Devanagari. Men do not read Devanagari. Hello, men read Persian and Urdu. Women read Devanagari and Urdu. Men eat meat from that community. Women are vegetarian. Men like Urdu, puzzles, kubris, etc. Women, so the pajans. There's a cultural difference, male and female, which has traveled down from men being from an aggressive community and the women being. So, what happens is the children are born and this. They spend the first five years with their mothers, speaking whatever the mothers speak. But the mothers speak is this thing which some people say under the ear, some people say uh, just a different stream. Uh, languages which have things like, uh, how do you say it in Tamil, uh, in the house? The ill, right? Sanskrit thing with the locative case ending. So basically, the kids grew up speaking something first that had an older base to it, an older syntax, a bunch of other things, uh, which I can tell you in detail. And only when the boys were there, about between five and ten, they were told, you know, actually, you are Arya, even though you up to now have not been. But you must start speaking like a boy and you learn Sanskrit. Girls were not expected to learn Sanskrit, they did not uh, generally pick it up very well. And uh, what they learned to you and me would just be Sanskrit with a Malayalam accent. Yeah. And they call that Prakrit because they were being so snooty. I mean, the, the grammar was the same, the words were the same, everything was. To say the accent was different, a lot more of the Sundays that you get in. I don't know Tamil, I know a little bit of Malayalam. So it sounded to me like they were speaking Sanskrit with a Malayalam accent, you got a proper. So the girls had a separate stream, the boys had a separate stream. And this is the kind of pattern that you get in, in the languages that Sanskrit remained there, not touched, not a dead end, an evolutionary dead end. No, no more evolution on you. And all the things that the children were speaking, which mixed the spoken Sanskrit and the local idea, we must do we must not do kare, we must do compound verbs, we must do various other things that are, we must put retroflexion. All these things crept into the language and the entire norm of India has this feature which was adopted by the Dravidians but is open to them. All of Indian languages have it. The exception of Assamese and the Nada over there and these two little tribal languages which I think have lost. So here we get a sense of how 
language is beginning to shape up. I'm not giving you very, uh, very broad strokes. You could make me make it finer than this, but I'm giving you a different kind of picture. Okay, Sanskrit did not do much for a while. It stayed. They were fighting each other. They were. I just remember we have the Rig Veda. Supposing we had something from what the other people there were saying, we would have had a very different picture of how important Sanskrit was in the world. I have a suspicion, which is why I looked at Kerala afterwards, that perhaps it was just a bunch of people writing about themselves in their small corner, fighting here and there, and other people living, okay, okay, so they're there, so what? There must have been a lot of that in the north, so far north, in fact, the whole north. For these people, maybe they will go away. I mean, not to be dealt with seriously. Then, about 700 years into their time in the subcontinent, they finished their battles, they created their alliances, gave the full kingdom. And then came the real spread. It's like with the British. The British came and they traded and they this and they that and they died of diseases and they married Indians and they this and they that. And, uh, nothing was happening. And then something happened and they started conquering the country. Yeah, the second era of Sanskrit was 700 years later when it suddenly said, you know, uh, we can be a kingdom if we sort out our differences. And the last uh, hymn of the Rig Veda is a really political hymn, which basically says all of us have to think alike. This is the only way things are going to go. And it doesn't even sound like any old Rig Vedic language. It sounds very modern to me. And then <coughs> they started moving. That was the time when they collected all the big leaders, which is sitting in families of Brahmin, we call them family books. They're not family books in the they for kids, they're family books, but they were families of Brahmins who had collected a bunch of these hymns and sat on them for 700 years with nothing written, a lot of garbage, some few more hymns than others, some knew the same hymns differently, and a bunch of people we would now call linguists, people like you actually went out on paid by the government. Isn't that nice? Once upon a time, they just get jobs in the Kuru Empire. Go and collect what these people are saying. And they did. And they collected it and they hassled that, no, oh, this person said this, no, oh, you know, that's not what I heard. This other family has it differently. In the end, they have to come to reconcile something and what they reconciled suddenly had a very systematic pattern of reflection. The Dravidian sounds worked well. But they were not as common as they were in the Prakrits, just as in the North, they're not as common as they are in Malayalam. But they were now there by the time. Everything we know formally about Sanskrit, even the Rig Veda, dates back to them. This is before Parliament's time. This is not the classical time, but which means there was a Rig Veda before that, which we tried to reconstruct. I tried to reconstruct where it didn't have any of this, which was when it first came. And little kids knew that we can say, la, la, la. When we talk to each other, but when we are writing this book and we are composing this, it doesn't have it, just like Persian doesn't have it, just like English doesn't have it. Indians are capable of doing that. If you write beautiful English for your Shakespearean uh, essays, and if I'm out of the, I don't know, retrofection comes right straight back. So, anyway, so in the second world age, you have the spread across North India, right? And this is goes to 600 BC, but it's continuing and it's going on. It goes on in flow. Let me show you my, it goes in Assam, 
all the thing wall, it goes, it hasn't yet gone into the self. So, so it's just after that. Um, by then, the Northwest is somewhat forgotten. I, <laughs> easy to tell because <coughs> just as the South has problems with uh, 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 so does the North, the Northwest. There's not a single language of Pakistan which is happy to say uh, 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 they are back to a Dravidian root, which avoids. So Punjabis, have you ever heard of Punjabi try to say Bharat? Bharat. Huh? We try to say Pai Pai. It's a tone, it becomes a tone and do you know from the tone that they're trying to say her? In Sindhi, they, they do it a little differently. Um, what would? Give what? an example. So, ask became a Muhammad Huh? Uh, instead of a regular ask, the ask became a Muhammad yeah, there is There is an other thing happening in Sindhi where they do an impressive, like you would say, uh, and the normal duh becomes a duh. So, adrubani. Adrubani. And the N is na, which is not allowed in Sanskrit rules, not allowed in the rest of the north of India. It's allowed in Dravidian languages and the languages of the northwest. So, suddenly you see the roots or the similarities re manifest because Sanskrit influence is slightly taken away. And the only places in India where this word culture remains. So I haven't figured it out yet completely why, but this is the only place. All, every bit of this is all full of retroflection. Can you imagine that the Pashtuns are speaking with retroflection? Yeah? The inclusive example that you just gave is also found in the Rajasthan. So Shekhawati had inclusives. Yes. Inclusives. Does it? Okay. Yes, Shekhawati had inclusives. So Nathan Busai uh, is another linguist who teaches at Hopkins now. So he uh, describes a range of languages in the border areas which have inclusives. Okay. So it is all the way from uh, starting from uh, Sydney, Katana, or further into Deshilver as you move in. So you have inclusive right here. Not just in inclusive, even in Rajasthan. If you have a this, yeah, yeah, you see the whole graph. Because I'm seeing you seeing the pattern so clearly of where you you're seeing the Indus Valley and some of it taken away by the I'm going to show you another picture of the Indus Valley now. Um okay. Am I do you mind if I'm jumping? I'm showing you patterns, I'm not telling you history. Yeah. And how is my time going? Can we wind up another five ten minutes? Yes, I can. Time. I'm going to take you down to the south, and that's it. I, I'll skip Malayalam unless you want to in the question. John, is like, no. But, 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 I can do it. You can do the broad strokes, but you know, we have five right. questions. So about five, ten minutes, and then people say, sort of Somewhere or, around the 12th century in Europe, in India, etc., you start seeing the modern languages coming up. Up till then, we had the Prakrits. Magadha and Prakrit look pretty much like. In our Prakrit, just kind of like local differences. It was the Prakrits and Sanskrit were a unified thing across India. Suddenly, in the modern languages, that's no longer so. We start getting all the Dravidian, Southeast Asian tribal features into the main structures, and it's like there's a tectonic plate between the Pink and the green zones, which I describe it as that, where gender just ends. And suddenly, how do you deal with the language of the green side has no gender? It has no alliterativity, any kanakaya. I buy me food, even no, I ate food. I ate, you can say ate. You can't say that on the pink side. Food is eaten by me. You know? Now you start. Sinhala is a different because it's, I have to work on it to figure out how it fits. You begin to see that the entire thing area and skipped here is that teapot thing on the top, which is Rahui, which is a Dravidian language, fully Dravidian, 
and I'll give you my suspicions about it. If everything here is Dravidian too, and that is Dravidian but different, what does that tell you? It's probably a nature migration. It looks too like that. It doesn't look like Northern Dravidian, which is to say language X, which is to say the Indus Valley. So the whole rain shadow of the Indus Valley is I unfortunately thrown in some reduction. I should not have done that. Um, but you basically, that whole Northern area picked up its substratum of language in Hindi, Punjabi, in Marathi, Konkani, all of these languages is from that substratum that is the Indus Valley. The easiest thing to see is it says by me, which is just that area of India. The green area is Ekta uh, and a few other features, and no gender, and straight out past I it. And of course, there's the South, and the differences in the South, I'm going to look at now because the South can't come in too simple. We can't say that it was the South. There was a fusion that took place long back. And which has to have left its radioactive particles floating around. Yeah, since I have only five minutes, let's move on. You want to hear Malayalam? Again, 12th century is a magical time in India. Or sometime around the 8th century, the Namudris were called in. Why I looked at Malayalam was not because I wanted to go south. I was terrified. I didn't know the language. Uh, I wanted the closest thing I could find to a remake of the situation in the upper Indus Valley when the Sanskrit people came in. What was it really like? As I asked you, if we, if, imagine if all we knew of Kerala was what the Navodhavis told you about the Rigveda. You would have a very limited picture of Kerala. So we have a limited picture of the North. What would Kerala tell us about? Not just the North of migration in general. So basically, these men came in, in the eighth century. They were in tracts of land, the intense caste system, they can't marry out only the oldest son, etc., or whatever. But there is mixing, which is not with Nayas, not, not technically acknowledged. So they, they affect the language and affect the population. A few things to notice. We have no idea what they spoke when they got here, but by the 8th century, no one was speaking Sanskrit. They brought Sanskrit, but they spoke something else. So, did the in the study people bring Sanskrit and speak something else? Certainly. Do we know what it is? No, because always in India, people throw away their vernacular language. Jews in Kerala threw away what they spoke and kept Hebrew. Um, Syrians threw away what they spoke, kept Syriac. So there is an amazing tendency for the uh, local language to get lost. So somewhere around the 12th century, which seems to have been a golden age in every way in India, the uh, Mudris themselves who had the right to in Sanskrit suddenly stand up on a wider audience. We were to write the same edits in Malayalam. And what happens when you try to write the same stuff in Malayalam? It doesn't have words for some of the things. They pull these words out of not Prakrits like in the north. Malayalam is the only language in India to have gone straight to Sanskrit with its words. And those words are almost all nouns. So, so if you look at Malayalam, should I show you a picture of how I think Malayalam looks? This is something I made. This is my upstairs terrace. I had to do a white floor to keep the heat out from my daughter's room below. But I said, it's so boring. Why not put some pretty granite? What do you see in that drawing? What do you see? It's an octopus. Except that the maximum number of stones and the thing that is holding it together is the white cement and the white marble. So it's like in, in Malayalam, you'll see all the pretty Sanskrit words, they're very colorful, but they, the language, they don't hold the language together. There is a cement 
And that cement is a Dravidian older structure, which you're not seeing because this is so colorful. You're seeing this lovely octopus dancing around there, and in fact, the language is held together by a matrix matrilineal system. Everything fits together. The mother tongue and then the father tongue is the octopus. So I, I like to show this to explain how I think Malayalam came up. And the amazing thing that it was all out. I mean, I have one or two words here and there. But I haven't checked adjectives, but it's just not true. Huge amounts of text, no, 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 no. Five nouns in the sentence, all Sanskrit. And I'll quickly get to Urdu on that particular note because you're going to see when we get to yeah, the migration from Central Asia, Uzbekistan, not even a major Uzbekistan, far away, Parana Andijan, which is right next to uh, the Uyghur lands in China. Uh, and they did not speak initially Persian at all. They spoke Persian the way you and I speak English. They spoke uh, uh, Uzbek and wrote in Chaktai. The opening line of uh, Babur's memoirs were translated into Persian. A Turk can follow what was to do. Nobody knew who knows Persian here. So, so, you do, but you've you've read what I wrote there. Huh? Yeah. It's not Persian at all. I, I, should I recite what the opening line to get a sense of the language you came with? Ramazan, I will tare sekis that's not good. It's, it's, it's a supposedly written in Turkish. Huh? It's, it sounds like Turkish, doesn't it? It's just written in Turkish. No, 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 Turkish does not have and and modern Uzbek doesn't have the e, 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 e. but I've restored everything <laughs> because I sat with a friend from Tabriz and over WhatsApp we cracked it from a photograph and we figured out what Babu had written. There was nothing like Persian. Yeah. So here's this guy coming in, another story like the Nambudris. They come in from this place called Farana and Bijan, and um, they bring this ornate language called Persian while they speak Uzbek and write in Chaktai, just like the Sanskrit men came speaking something else. It's nice through Uzbek. You have like five, six Uzbek words in Urdu. No. Uh, and they came, and let's see. I probably have reached the south at last. So they came to, in, to the north where they met a thing called Delhi. And the Hindi, Urdu was Hindi, is Hindi, split later on. Before they arrived, this fully alive modern language from this Western Indo Aryan family was there and it was called Delhi, and it became very important only because it was in Delhi. Any other language could have been much more well elaborated, but this one was there. When a language is spoken in the capital city, it automatically gains importance. So this language came up, but Persian was the language of the court. But people on the ground were not speaking Persian. Then uh, Aladdin Kilji says, Adeka, let's go over the Mithyas, let's take a bit more territory, maybe we get tribute, maybe we get. And eventually came up these empires, which I am planning to do as a map of the form of a rainbow, because you're really getting a zone that is so mixed between north and south that it's 
where the model will be built, my model. This is where I'm going to not in my writing, it's not in my book. But what happens when languages from the north and the south mix? What can mix? All of the first thing to remember is languages are just a mirror, these are people. The people are men and women. Who were the men? Who were the women? Which men came in? Mostly men are the ones who come in. And they're also very enterprising local men who come in and bring their families. There are a lot of women who marry men who come in. So you get languages forming around layers of like the, the Lakini story as I see it, and you correct me, this is my large ballpark figure, is the wonderful port where a lot of people came from the north where we were not yet speaking Urdu as a serious language, but it was very much there, alive. And uh, they start writing literary Urdu, which is totally northern <laughs> in Hyderabad. Not in the north, but in Hyderabad. Then you have Dakini, which is also there, which is from the families of the men who migrated with very noble or whatever educated women from the south. Then you have families where the men also come from the south, and a decision was made that to join the new community. So you, I am wondering whether you will see, and I think I do, differences in the language of the literary Urdu that came up with people who were still coming in from the north, and the families, the Ashrafis where the men came from the north and married local women and the language fused, but in a not in such a not in such a disruptive way. And then the people who were totally Telugu speaking, probably uh, you know, some with some Marathi, some uh, Kannada, they moved in to adopt this language with a tremendous amount of borrowing. Dravidian syntax, not totally. So you're getting a model of a living situation in which this thing that we talked about happening in the past is still happening. That's where I've reached right now in my writing. I've reached, I've told you what I only speculating and I'm still looking for historical evidence. I don't want to take you further. English, I haven't got it to English, I haven't got it to Bengali, but I also run out of time. And you will be. Can I get back to it? Then I think so. <laughs> I think people by now watching this must be thinking I look like a man. <laughs> All right, whatever. <clears throat> okay, so any questions? I'm sure that there will have to be some. Uh, I think it looks like so many people are here yeah. <clears throat> and try to be as loud as possible. Yeah. So uh, I had a, a, an audible, right? Yeah, to me. Yeah. Uh, I hope an audible uh, to the people joining online as well. So um, I was thinking about two things primarily. And uh, this, these questions. I, I had them while I was reading your book, and I uh, was thinking with you as you were uh, delivering this rather taking us into this rather spectacular journey. Um, so the first thing is uh, with respect to Ahamia or Assamese, uh, and one of the things that is very interesting is that uh, the term, which is uh, like you know, like spread throughout the language, right? Like it's one of the most important sounds in Ahomia. <laughs> Spoken Ahomia talk is everywhere, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you also have the talk. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that um, my hunch is from uh, having learned the language and having spoken it for quite a few hundred years now um, is that, you know, it might be that there was a point uh, when retroflex was there and then it gets dropped and then there are traces of it 
that is still there in the in, in spoken of communities. And um, that is something, uh, and, and it gets very interesting because um, because Ohomia has this long history of uh, trying to uh, build uh, an identity that is separate from Bangla and from Korea, uh, you know, that's when uh, a lot of these changes in the language gets standardized. And, and what we have now is Ohomia that looks very different um, from, uh, you know, Bangla and Korea, and you know, it's written differently, it's spoken differently, words are different, absolutely, and loan words coming from Tibetan and you know from Hong Kong, which which has which shares um, you know were similarities with Thai. Um, but the other thing, and this is something because retroflex is the main, it's the hero of your book. Right, <laughs> and I love how you how you uh, coined uh, this uh, linguistic DNA tag, right? And how retroflex literally becomes the site of history. We are thinking of history in a long term perspective, and if language is where we are going to look at history. And with respect to Ohomia, I was uh, very intrigued to know. Um, uh, what is your thought on the voiceless valor cricketer? Because this is a very, very interesting yes. thing. And Ohomia has it, uh, Siliti has it, and this is literally the site where the war is uh, waged. Yeah. Um, and because uh, when you write, it is sir and sure, but uh, when you speak, it is always this voiceless well of right? So, um, and what's interesting is now when you write, you also, and it's with romanization, mm -hmm. right? You can't do it in the, yes, X, and you can't do it in the Ohomia alphabet, but you can do the voiceless well of in the Roman uh, transliterated. So when, as scholars, we write, uh, there is, of course, this, uh, when we do the transliteration thing, there's, of course, this thing that is more and more uh, moved towards doing uh, a, a homia, following a, a homia transliteration rather than the Library of Congress. Uh, what you seem to be saying is that we are pushed towards a standardization. I, in linguistics, I find very often I read a description of the language what is interesting to me is what is not in it. And what's often not in it is the variation. People don't conform to this pattern. And the historical dimension that how recent is all of this that we're talking about in the language. That just like with the two tribal languages, which appear to have had retroflection a century ago, uh, Assamese could have had it, but lost it. Uh, one would have to find out. And of course, new features coming in like the fun, um, that's there. Um, but the point being that, that the interesting things to me are when we look outside of standardization and see what it hides. Because I didn't look at a standardized picture of Dakini from a linguistic description. You don't get the variety and the possibility of the direction of flow that you would get if you look on a long, larger perspective. So I want to get that in without getting tripped up by the normal variety stuff for its own sake. But, but Assam is definitely an area on the fringe where things would have started to change first. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I can continue. Yeah, can you come up a little closer so we can hear you better? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Uh, I was thinking a uh, few questions. Thank you, that was very interesting. Uh, first, I was thinking about migrations and females and matter relative to each other. So this will be true largely for 
higher vertebrates. I'm just thinking about sea turtles. I'm thinking about where you're actually. Your females are traveling a great deal in order to lay eggs elsewhere. So therefore, it's not. You know, and and I can well, a whole slew of other micro species, including wildebeest, to be like, which so that that hasn't. So is this? I mean, I also think whether there it's our selected species versus case selected species, so where, where there's no parental investment versus, yeah. versus those which have more. So, so you had me thinking about that. And, and the other, of course, the question of life strategies, and that is um, even among primates. I mean, the point eventually, if I mean, you know, the biology, biology, the whole notion of big source defense polygyny and female defense polygyny. So, therefore, the role for female, purely from a biological perspective, right, is access to resources, access to females, right? Because then the, the female is the key to get to their mission, right? The so female is an access to? In the key field is to resource. Because, I mean, for the I'm looking purely from an environmental perspective, right? And then you have the male. So, therefore, it stands to reason that you're going to have. If resources are present in a particular area, there is no particular incentive for the female to move. Yeah. Like if access to females is the issue, then that would be the driving ingredient for females. So that would be a biological. I don't know about the access to females, and I've always wondered, like in the case of the Central Asian migrations uh, during the Sultanate and the Mughal era, uh, the Sultanate was not a time when it would have been comfortable to think of leaving your wives and children behind. But still, most of the men who came from, South, from Central Asia came in families and married here. I, I don't completely understand it, how they did it. Uh, because, um, and what happened to the women? The women were absorbed then by the next ones coming in, I guess. But uh, when, when you think about it, uh, the many of the Muslim families in the north, not, not the not the Malabar coast, came to India, actually did not come in military campaigns. They came safely because that area was beset by Japanese huts and uh, you had to get out. So, but the idea that so many got out, some women did come. There, I mean, there were stories of the women and that they were different, they didn't, they didn't wear purple and so on, but there were not many of them. So that means that even at the best of times when people wish to bring women, they still didn't, but they still brought few. So there's some kind of law of nature in a way, and we are whatever niche we belong to, higher primates or whatever. Theirs, theirs are not primates at all. But on the other hand, gillers will move because they're air pocket. Mm. That's a situation where you have gorillas, where you will have the silver back and you're holding a heron. Mm. Right? So a lot is to do with the nature of the food you're also eating. Because they're low nutrients, whereas the given is high nutrient and B nutrients. Right? So even among primates, there are going to be differences. I think it's problematic when it comes to human beings because cultural evolution is so often seen as analogous to biological evolution. Yeah, but I mean, the takeoffs of the history of the fishing fleet, right? Yeah. When you had British women being sent to India. Oh, no, no, no. no. That, that is, that's, no, the British women came to India Fine. very simply because the Suez Canal was open that's and fine. steamships could make the distance in less than six weeks. And they also remember the India they came to was not the India the men came to. The men were setting up an empire. The women were coming to get the rich pickings of the men who were well set up but didn't have women and might marry locals. And there was, of course, there was the issue that Cornwallis was scared that if a new if a community came up in India of locals marrying the Brits, they would have probably done like the Americans and demanded independence. So the Indians demanded independence without the British being party to it. But um, no, the, the British woman came later when it was safe to come. Just the same way as the woman came to the Caribbean estates later when they when 
there was every possible incentive to make women come because we knew they knew that the migration was not the last, and you needed a population that could replace itself. Slaves in the in African slaves were initially probably not women. You the small estates, you needed a few men, you did not have industrial scale of production. And so you only started seeing women and the mass of people who did not speak English or French or Dutch or Portuguese when industrial scale plantations came up. So women always seemed to be there but late in the entire age. And so it's not just simply about whether we have pair bonds or not. It has something to do with the nature of migration and uh, human settlement. I'm, I'm, I'm sure somebody who works on human settlement, but you see it all over again, very little of women migrating until it's safe and the route is set up and uh, it's clear where to go. I mean, look at me coming from last night all the way and knowing that I am stepping onto a flight which is taking me to go out. I, 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 my bag will probably be transferred. I mean, I am in thinking in a million ways that like what am I doing? <laughs> and I get onto off a Chennai airport, don't speak the local language. No, I have to. Now, I understand I manage your case, but it is not the same sort of thing that many people like. During partition, a lot of the women who've never been outside the house who managed to go to Pakistan, their halak was just terrible because it's not merely out of the house, uprooted from everything they imagine. So there is a bit of that in sedentary populations. And women take for granted that things have been set up. Very few of us have to be interested in flying off into the dark. Took Chennai one ago, <laughs> whatever. Vishnu has a question. Professor Vishnu has a question. Yes. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Peggy. It is a wonderful. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading your book. And uh, the the first is a question, which is, uh, what is the kind of story uh, to do with the uh, Adivasis of the Central India and Eastern India? What is the in in your story? Where do they fit in, or uh, what 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 are they connected to? Uh, that's the kind of question. It's all obviously from that you can imagine from the vantage point of ignorance rather than knowledge because I'm not a linguist. That's the, that's a question that I wanted to know a bit uh, from you. And second, there is a methodological insight that I'm gleaning from uh, from what you said, uh, and that is in, in the 19th century and pretty much in 20th century even now much of the stories of the language and literature in India was actually trying to, uh, trying to be, people are writing that history uh, as, a, as, a, as an exercise in purity, as an exercise in, in, in saying that the literature, as if there's a kind of boundedness to every uh, literature and, and language. Let's say, I mean, Samyak spoke about Ahamya, Bengali, Maithili, Odia, you know, there are, they, you, know, they, you can call them as sisterly languages or whatever, the languages overlapping nature of languages. But in 19th century, century language politics and nationalism actually prepared a different kind of storytelling about literature where everybody is trying to erase these influences. Everybody has to tell a story of uh, purity and greater purity of language and literature. It actually, and your story actually is telling of flow. And here is a nationalism often tell the story by stopping the flow. You know, no, flow is disruptive. Flow is, flow, flow disrupts the storytelling of, 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 of a monolith of, 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 of certain coherence. So that's, I think I thought was a very interesting methodological insight from that story of, of a long uh, history. And uh, I don't know what you have to say as a linguist, because, uh, you know, the, as you can tell, it's a good example. You know, if you go to uh, the history of literature in, in Odia and Bengali and so on, they all go back to 8th, eight, 8th and 10th century and describe the same stuff. Let's say Charyagits or Buddhist. 
as the proto odia proto bengali i'm sure they're proto maithili they're all right but 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 there's an attempt to say that look every history is a parallel uh, not intersecting history that's what i'm taking from uh, what you are presenting here uh, and so on so these are the kind of things one is a comment uh, what i'm gleaning from what you said and the first is the adivasi the languages in the central and eastern india how do they yeah thank you See, the 8th to 12th century was a real golden age in india where in the process of getting rid of the prakrits which just completely unified the elites while people spoke probably languages which are now extinct maybe languages which still link back to the indo-sardi languages or the old languages santali and so in the eastern area suddenly we start getting what looked like large self contained regions even kerala in a different uh, zone is pe- feeling it to 12th century is a very special time and so in a way the same thing is happening and it is creating the impression of this, of difference but it, so that's the I- irony of it it's the same forces which are removing prakrit from the top but which are creating viable regions rather than an unwieldy uh, decaying empire so i don't find that so strange everybody's got to create their mythology to make that little region have a little uh, central gravity to it about the original tribals that's going to be a work i i want to get into later we we don't know enough we have little bits of information here and there The point is that why I like to think that these are original tribes everywhere we look they are mixed with somebody and so much so that we are so divided them into Dravidian tribes and Austroasiatic tribes and to separate these layers in terms of historical events all of this I like to think that languages may reflect political and historical events political may mean migrations may be invasions uh, events definitely something that changes the environment in such a way that a very different uh, approach is needed for the next generation so how different are the languages which are called Dravidian from the ones that are called Austroasiatic these things and in what way with how much does it go beyond vocabulary the huge time differences because these same people have been in India for like longer than anyone else uh, at least a part of them so it's a lot of pulling apart of uh, strands these people are a composite already they just happen to have a little more of the original India in them but there's two composites thank you Well, thank you very much. This one has a question. May I ask one? Yeah. Okay. So the story of Kerala, uh, even though it just gave a broad scope of it. So what was the interesting experiment about Manipuri Valley? Mm-hmm. I mean, how uh, the Dalit Kerala takes it, takes a grammatical treatise out. What do you see there? Do you see there a effort for standardization being happening? So what is for, often people consider standardization as a modern process, but I see Lalitha Kalam and Manipuri Valley. The very first text and the Lalitha Kalam being basically an exercise of standardization. So standardization is something that is external to India. Is often is the opinion that is being brought up something that is a modern method. You see here is not a modern method. Lalitha Kalam is from the sixteenth century. It's something that's modern. See, let me compare two situations which I find very crazily similar. Kerala and Hyderabad. Hyderabad again, the not not the thing, uh, the literary. See, in in Hyderabad, in the fourth language was Persian. In Kerala, the language of ethics was Sanskrit. So Persian and Sanskrit. At some point, they decided we are getting away from these. So they take the matrix into the local language. Malayalam, you have northern Urdu, not even the right. So you have these two languages there, but they are incomplete because the 
the subject matter is decided that you need to say a large number of things which have not been said before in this language. So where do you pull them from? The other language you do. So no effort is being made to affect Urdu and Malayalam. The, the attempt is being made to get away from Sanskrit actually and get away from Persian. But, but it sounds as though it's the opposite because it results in Persian coming into Urdu. But very little, there was very little of it before. And suddenly Sanskrit coming in the purest uh, Tatsama form into Malayalam. Okay. What is crazy is that in both of these languages now, and people say, are you sure no adjectives? Well, there may be, you know, I know that one or two verbs I find from time to time, but it should, but it's your but teach your which is to make it sort of but can is it Sanskrit? Uh no, uh, okay. But the root part is Bodhi is okay, Bodhi oh, what is the word you're repeating? Yeah, what Sanskrit is but teach. Oh, buddy, but uh, okay. It is it is Sanskrit. Yeah, listen, but I can't tell you more. But uh, I can't find too many more. So, I know, but maybe it's saying it quite enough, but I know. It is that. So, in a sense, I'm not sure that the word standard, I have a funny de the definition of standardization, which uh, works for me, and that is that it's not even a voluntary exercise. It's basically people sitting and saying, this is the language of power, this is the language of the capital city, this is the language of the center of the empire or the center of trade, and it's going to be in what we use. And here and there, the little things get added in the form of vocabulary, usually. Because all efforts, and a student came to me, he's saying, how can I get my dialect standardized? I said, what would be the purpose of your doing it? That's not how it gets done. Your saying so may not have an effect. It's going to happen because of forces that have nothing to do with language. Everything to do with economics and a bit to do with politics. Imagine, Hindi came out when it was not even liked politically, Persian was being used. But economically, a number of things were happening. Apart from the fact that the ordinary people were speaking it, because ordinary people were suddenly literate <coughs> and wanted legal systems and wanted uh, <coughs> lists, wanted uh, the kind of things that people do outside the scripture. They probably are the ones, who, and there was much more of it to be done because it was <coughs> even if the court was not involved. So similarly, you'd find that in, in Kerala, it's not ethics anymore. It's quite a lot of politics, and of course, science and technology. I mean, when the government puts out something, it's a beautifully Dravidian syntax of full of Sanskrit words. It's just absolutely mind blowing. Next the world to be that South India, but for everything is, is Sanskrit. And this is just amazing. Look at it. So it's, and it's happening almost on its own. No linguist put his hand to it and said, this is how it should be done. Yeah, no linguist. I have a question. Um, uh, you find that like, the, uh, the migration um, affected the scripts um, in different languages, um, like from, like, say, Indo Aryan languages that we did with many things in the script and things? Script. Um, the only thing I can say is that, like, when you look at the scripts, there's a slight similarity at times. What is bigger than the slight similarity in the look is like if you go all the way to Southeast Asia, all the way to Indonesia, in the parts of um, Thailand, and so there's one simple way to tell if a script is inspired by an Indian language. That is which mantra? Any one of them? Which mantra? Chandra Bindu. Chandra Bindu. Chandra Bindu. 
No, it's the one way you can instantly tell a language inspired yes, by an Indian language, and even Sanskrit was inspired by something earlier, is that the short E is to the left and not to the right. That is the whole mark of it. You see, suddenly all Indian students are given a piece of all students in the US given a piece of homework to decode original Bhattu script in Sumatra. And Indians get it straight away. Yeah. And the Americans just can't get it out. They can't understand that a vowel pronounced to the right of a consonant is written to the left. That is an Indian touch. Just, it's, it's, it's funny, it's little touches like this. It's not the Tamil. You don't Probably know. not. I know that when Gurmukhi doesn't have uh, yeah. intelligence and not talent, but, but by being unintelligent and having it, we've got a historical tracer. And in Thai, they have a whole lot of extra sounds which shouldn't be there at all, but Sanskrit had them, so they kept them. Tamil, early Granta script, has a bunch of sounds that don't belong there at all. But they were there, so keep them. So that kind of thing, it's, well, it's like the GH and daughter. It's completely unpronounced, and yet you can go all the way back to Proto-Indo-Aryan with Dukhita, it was the person in the family who built the house, the Milton. And it's, it's nice that you, you ate it when you were a little child and you spell, but it takes you back to a very ancient age. Look at that. Yeah. The daughter is the one who builds the cows. This ain't no because I'm reading on some minutes. Probably in linguistics. <laughs> oh, crazy things we can do in this. When we talk about the whole Bengal area, we started discussing the reason for foreigners, the reason for elephants. Uh, uh, I mean, I had to cut this down because from what would be a two hour per week lecture for a whole course, where we get into all of this. But to just give you an overview, but sometimes an overview is a great thing because then you come up with your own completely different strands, which I would never have thought of. I learned already this morning a bunch of things, which I haven't thought of. It's going to bother you a lot. Okay, so if there are no questions, can we pull it again? You know, Turkish, I can read the Russian script. Yeah, but strangely, this is not normally written in Korean script. It is actually written in Jagtai, which was known to power as Turkey. Yeah. So they call it later Turkey. in Akbar Street, it was translated to Persian by Abdullahi. Yeah. I know, like, but my friend in Iran who reads Persian beautifully because she's grown up there, she said she'd never before seen Azari in Persian script. It's great. And we use Azari and what I knew of Turkish to crack back Jagdai, which was written in Persian, badly handled. Again, thank you very much on behalf of me, Joya, and Vishnu, and also on the, on the audience, audience here, and also people who have been with the next classes. Thank you very much. Thank you.